Amen. I'm going to invite you to take your Bibles, turn to the book of 2 Peter, uh, chapter 2 is where we're going to be here this morning. From time to time, over the news, it'll come on your televisions. Uh, if you have the alerts on your phone, uh, you will get them more than once. I have been awakened by an amber alert. And an amber alert is issued when a child or children uh, have disappeared, whether on their own volition or not. Very often, it comes from custodial interference or it comes from uh, uh, just a kidnapping, plain and simple. The amber alert will give all kinds of information it will give a description of that child. Uh, if uh, it's a custodial matter, they will include perhaps the make and model of a car. They will include the license plate number. They will tell you where they were last seen. Why did they put this information out? Simple. They want to make sure that that child is no longer in harm's way. They want to make sure that they are not in danger and that they can be reunited with their loved ones. You know what? So very often people will get tired of hearing those alarms and they will go on their phone and they will disable the Amber Alert um, chime. Okay? I don't need to be bothered with that, they would say. Oh, that's far enough away. We'll never see them over here. We can come up with a myriad of reasons why we would neglect to look at those and to be informed of what they say and to be informed of who we are supposed to be looking for. Amber alerts are very important and very necessary to bring a very hostile situation hopefully, to a place of peace. You know what? When we look at false teachers, it's important for us to know what those characteristics are. What do they look like? How do they act? Because if we don't know what a false teacher looks like, we will fall for anything, won't we? We will trust anything. And so here in Second Peter uh, chapter 2, we're going to start in verse 10. And really, for the next several weeks, we're going to be looking at some of these uh, characteristics of the false prophets and false teachers. Remember, Peter has already said the problem isn't that they're going to come into your church. The problem is they're already there. And so, you know, when you know somebody, when you go to church with them, when you sit down and you eat with them or you work alongside them, it can be very easy, can't it, to look at things through, I believe the phrase is rose-colored glasses, right? Uh, everything is just beautiful. Everything is good. The unfortunate thing is the false teachers know this, and they will put themselves out there as, as the purveyors of truth, and they will put themselves out there as the ones who you can trust, and then over time, they will go ahead and introduce heresies into the church, teachings that are not in Scripture. And we talked about this last week, a, a gospel that is anything other than the gospel of Christ is no gospel at all. It's, it's error and it's heresy. And the unfortunate understanding is that there are many people that will believe in that gospel instead of the true gospel. What's the problem with that? This gospel does not save. Anything short of a gospel that does not show you that you are a sinner in need of God's grace and that Christ died on the cross for you and that you must uh, confess, possess, believe that what Christ has done for you, if you believe anything other than that, it's a false gospel. And the unfortunate thing is that many false teachers are leading people right to the gates of hell itself because they are preaching that this is the true gospel when it is not. 
that's rather sobering when you start to think about that and consider that. And so really, uh, Peter is saying here, we need to watch out for these people. We need to watch out for, uh, for what they teach. They are profane. Uh, they are purveyors of error. They seduce hearts and minds of men. Does that sound like rather strong language? I hope so, because it was meant to be. And when you read 2 Peter chapter 2, Peter never had a problem opening his mouth, did he? And you know, sometimes he got a lot of flack for that. He just, he just opened his mouth at the wrong time, or he said the wrong thing, or this or that. Here in the second chapter of 2 Peter, I'm going to say this, uh, Peter really doesn't hold anything back. Uh, if, you, if you read through that, um, there are some rather shocking illustrations that Peter gives um, when it comes to false teachers. We're going to see one of them is he calls them animals, unreasoning animals, born as creatures of instinct to be captured or killed. Okay, that's rather strong language. It's hard to get away from that. That's in verse 12. In those words, there is a divine assault on false teachers, and rightly so. We need to call them out, and we need to know who they are and what they stand for. So what Peter is saying here is that these teachers have the same mind as animals that just go off of instinct and nothing else. Okay? Now, I'm a dog person, right? You all remember Molly? Yeah, I tried to get Harold to take care of Molly. He wouldn't do it. It only took him coming over to the house once, and, and Molly met him at the gate, and it wasn't a pleasant exchange. Um, if I would have brought her here, Harold, she would have been fine. You were in her turf, and she let you know. Okay, so uh, Molly passed away last year. So now we have the boys. We have two cats. I'm a dog person. One of the cats has adopted me. And I will sit down on the couch and pretty soon that crazy cat will come over and just plop down right beside me. Karen is over on the other side of the couch and so this cat is kind of going back and forth sometimes. And we just get the biggest kick out of it. I've never been adopted by a cat before. One of the things I'm reminded of is, you know, this cat, as crazy as this cat is, um, can't seem to make up his mind between Karen and I. I mean, go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, to the point where either Karen or I will say out loud, pick one or the other, just stop. So many times animals are that way, right? They're creatures of instinct. And they will adapt to whatever environment that they are in. They will do anything that they can do. Quite honestly, they do what they want to do. Why? They can't reason. That's what makes us different than cats, for example. That's what makes us different from dogs. Um, we have the ability to reason, right? Animals can't do that. And what Peter is saying here, he is saying that these false teachers are just as bad as those animals that operate solely on a self-indulgence. They act entirely on instinct. There's no rational thought that they have. They cannot balance your checkbook. They cannot do this or do that. And so here the false teachers are described in this way. You know, you might ask the question, boy, Peter spends an awful lot of time talking about false teachers. Um, why does he get so angry? Why does he get so upset uh, at these false teachers? Uh, well, the answer is really quite simple. The answer is this, Peter is a pastor. How's that for a simple answer? Peter's a, a pastor. 
He has been given by the Lord himself the task of shepherding the flock. That was what Peter uh, was to do. He was to shepherd the master's sheep. And so you'll remember, back in the Gospels, several times Peter was told, feed my sheep, feed my lambs, feed my sheep. Remember that? He was given the role of the shepherd. He was to feed the flock. And that's a, that's a very serious calling. So from the very outset, Peter was called to be a shepherd who fed the sheep, and he gets angry and upset when there are false teachers who will come in to poison the sheep. That's why he gets so angry and why he gets so upset. There was a story told of a man, you know, uh, prices are going up everywhere, right? And uh, this man had a mule, and he would feed this mule uh, some oats. Well, pretty soon, boy, oats got expensive. So he decided that he would go ahead and slowly over time, he would replace the oats with sawdust. Well, you can imagine what happened. Everything was okay for a little bit. But eventually, the mule died. Why? The diet was no good. That sawdust was poison. Can you imagine what that would do? Well, the case is true spiritually as well. The changeover from truth to error is sometimes a slow process, but the end result is exactly the same. How many people do you know that have been shipwrecked in their faith because they have believed error and they have followed a lie? It happens so very often. And so here you have Peter, you have the man of God. He's exhibiting the passion of a pastor. The sheep that he has been given to shepherd, he wants to make sure that they are grounded, that they are protected, that they are well taken care of. And so this is why Peter gets so angry and upset. The first 10 verses of Second Peter chapter 2, some pretty strong language in there. We reach the middle of verse 10. You might think Peter has finally got it out of his system. But yet he doesn't. He keeps going on. And as he is doing that, he is doing that for the purpose of showing us what these false teachers look like. And so in verses 10 through 16, we see this description. I'm going to go ahead and read it. And especially those who indulge in the lust of defiling passion, despising authority. We talked about that last week. Bold and willful, they do not tremble as they blaspheme the glorious ones, whereas angels, though greater in might and power, do not pronounce a blasphemous judgment against them, before the Lord. Verse 12, but these, like irrational animals, creatures of instinct, born to be caught and destroyed, blaspheming about matters of which they are ignorant, will also be destroyed in their destruction, suffering wrong as the wage for their wrongdoing. They count a pleasure to revel in the daytime. They are blots and blemishes, reveling in their deceptions while they feast with you. They have eyes full of adultery, insatiable for sin. They entice unsteady souls. They have hearts trained in greed. Accursed children, forsaking the right way, they have gone astray. They have followed the way of Balaam, the son of Baor, who loved to gain from wrongdoing, but was rebuked for his own transgression. A speechless donkey spoke with human voice, and restrained the prophet's madness. There's a lot of stuff there. 
in verses 10 through 12, we see this, that the, one of the marks of a false teacher is that they are rebellious. They are rebellious. And so the apostles and the teachers emphasized purity. They emphasized cleanliness before God. But the false teachers in the church denied these standards. And can I say that in their eyes, anything went. You could do whatever you wished. They denied these standards that were demonstrated in their desires of the flesh, pollution, corruption, uh, defilement of the flesh. Uh, these are desires of the sinful nature. And the false teachers would say, that's okay. You don't need to worry about that. We talked about Sodom and Gomorrah. They really should have worried about that. And yet the false teachers say, that's okay. There's no worry there. Does this sound very familiar to the book of Jude? It should, because there is a lot of carryover that we find here. We are told, I believe it's in the King James, that word bold uh, that you see. Uh, let me see here, verse uh, 10. Another word for that, I believe in the King James Version, is presumptuous. They are bold, they are presumptuous. They are arrogant. And they are arrogant to the point where they will blaspheme. They will blaspheme and slander the celestial beings. And we saw this also in uh, the book of Jude. What did the book of Jude say? You know what? The angels wouldn't dare do that. They left that to God himself. And here, the arrogance of these false teachers who will do what the angels will not. What does that look like for us? Well, you know what? For the false teachers today, it's going to look something like this. Or, uh, Kenneth Copeland, uh, in one of his messages that he did, uh, this was back in 2020, uh, he decreed that COVID was gone and was no more. This was right at the beginning of the pandemic. Okay, what do we know about COVID? Karen and I just had it. Boy, we wish he was right. He wasn't right. How do we know that? Uh, I believe right now, if, if I remember the figure correctly, somebody correct me if I'm wrong, Worldwide, they're saying over a million people have passed from COVID. Uh, you know what? Um, when Kenneth, Kenneth Copeland said, the Lord told me that COVID is done and that the entire United States of America is healed and there will be no more COVID and the numbers only went up, the arrogance, the presumption, presumptuous attitudes that are presented there. Folks, that's a problem. Whenever you say, the Lord told me, you better be sure the Lord told you. Did the Lord tell him that COVID was going to be done at noon on that day? Which God? Karen is right. The boldness and the presumptuous attitudes that they have we need to be careful, and we need to understand that this is a real thing. They will be arrogant. They will slander those who would disagree. We'll be talking about that here in a few weeks. And come to find out they were very ignorant about the very things that they blasphemed. Have you ever noticed that most people have an opinion on something they know nothing about? The false teachers are certainly no different. False teachers have such arrogant self-will. They imagine that they are powerful, that they are headstrong, yet they are rebellious, reckless in every way. 
They believe that they are superior in power and authority. There are some false teachers that will claim they can control the weather. Who can control the weather? A sovereign God sure can. There are some that would say uh, there is no place for sickness and disease within the family of God. And that they would rebuke that illness. A sovereign God, that's what he does. I can't cure cancer. I can't. God can, and praise God for that. But they have it on authority that they can do anything. If that is in fact the case, why do we worship God at all, right? Something that's very, very telling. They are very bold and presumptuous. We already talked about verse 12, they are animalistic. These, like irrational animals, creatures of instinct, born to be caught and destroyed, blaspheming about matters of which they are ignorant, they will be destroyed in their own destruction. Uh, they are like the beasts that you would find in the very first century. They operated from instinct. They were locked into their sin natures rather than rational choice. What a description that is. Rather harsh language. Peter uses that because he calls out those that would preach heresy for what they really are. A departure from the gospel. Verse 13 says this, they are deceitful, suffering wrong as the wage for their wrongdoing. They count a pleasure to revel in the daytime. They are blots and blemishes, reveling in their deceptions while they feast with you. There's a word play there, and really what's being said is this. They will be caught up in their own webs. Webs of lies and deceit, they will be caught there. They will be paid back with harm for the harm that they have caused to others. What does that harm look like? Well, preaching a false gospel for one. One of the cruelest things that I have ever seen would be, uh, and I've seen it several times, uh, so many of these false teachers will have a healing service and will pray over somebody uh, that has stage four cancer, for example. You're healed. You don't need to go to a doctor anymore. You don't need to take your medicine anymore. And that person who is clinging on to anything will believe that and will die a gruesome, painful death. Why? God wasn't in that. God did not heal them. And for them to say, God has given me the power to heal, you don't need these medications anymore. I have seen families that have been completely shipwrecked. I thought you said God would heal. I thought you said things would be okay. Here's where it gets really bad. And Harold and I over lunch, we've talked about this several times. Well, your loved one would have been okay if they had more faith. That should, that just makes me mad. Your loved one didn't have enough faith. I wonder how the martyrs felt about that. I wonder how the disciples felt about that. Yeah, you're going to be killed, but if you had enough faith, you'd be okay. How about those with COVID, so many of God's faithful, 
who have had COVID, and I've done a lot of funerals over the last several years for people, born again children of God. You know what? This wasn't an issue of them not having faith. That has nothing to do with it. It has everything to do with the sovereign God. Look at your family. I look at my family um, and everything that we've been through, that you've been through. I've been invited into some of your situations, and I've prayed with you, and I know where you've been. That is nothing short of spiritual abuse. And they will be judged for that. They will be judged for that. They revel in deceit. They are deceived and they deceive others as well. God has a lot to say about that. And they will be judged for the injustices that they do to others. Second Peter 2.14 says that they are chronic sinners. They are chronic sinners. They have eyes full of adultery, insatiable for sin. They entice unsteady souls. They have hearts trained in greed, accursed children. What does that mean? Does that mean that we don't sin? No, we do sin, don't we? Of course we do. Thought, attitude, action. We sin. What Peter is saying here is that you are unceasing in your sin. You know what? When we sin, the Holy Spirit of God convicts us, right? That's what he does. And we are told to repent of that sin. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, when we do that, he is faithful, he is just, he forgives us, he cleanses us. 1 John 3, 9, no one born of God makes a practice of sinning. It's not your lifestyle. It's not what you do. For God's seed abides in him. And it says he can't keep on habitually sinning because he has been born of God. That old nature has been replaced. You are a new creation in Christ, and their deceit was aimed at seducing, at baiting or enticing the unwary and the unsteadfast. They had become specialists in greed. They let the almighty dollar be their God. In the Greek, having a heart exercised in greed It comes from the same word that we get the word gymnasium. How many how many of y'all just love gym class? Okay, I didn't. I I didn't. Not really. Not my thing. Right? But you know, these days you go to a gym, what do you go to a gym for? To train, right? I mean, if uh, Scott and Chris they, they do some running every now and again. Right? Uh, I can guarantee you they don't just go out there and do a full marathon after, after eating a big breakfast and not running at all. There's, there's time that they have to prepare. Right? They have to take care of their bodies. There's certain things you have to do. This Greek word gymnasium means in this context that the false teachers were very good at being trained to deceive others and to accumulate a greed for themselves. They would say, we have a special level of knowledge. If you want to hear from God, you need to talk to me because I've got this. They have been trained in this. They will say, yeah, the Bible's good, but I've got something better. Friends, there's nothing better than the Word of God. That is how God speaks to us. And the false teachers, in their lies and deceptions, they become trained to do all of these things. 
Verses 15 and 16 says this, they are mercenary. They are mercenary. Forsaking the right way, it says they've gone astray. They have followed the way of Balaam, remember him, the son of Baor, who loved to gain from wrongdoing, but was rebuked for his own transgression. A speechless donkey spoke with human voice, restrained the prophet's madness. Peter goes back into the Old Testament and gives that illustration that we find uh, that we find there. He moves from a Genesis to Numbers. Balaam is in, in a chapters 20 through or 22 uh, through 24. Balaam had to be dealt with. Why? Because Balaam was only out for himself. God told me, God didn't tell you. And ultimately, it took a donkey that God used and gave him a voice. It took a donkey for Balaam to be rebuked. Money in the name of religion brings spiritual ruin to many people. Unfortunately, in the news, far too prevalent, you see where spiritual leaders have fallen into sexual depravity and sin and gives the kingdom of God a black eye. Over the course of the last month, I can think of three or four of these false teachers who, it was discovered, fell into that. And these errors bring ruin to so many people. It's very sad when we stop to consider the black eye that Christianity is given by those that don't even preach the gospel. But because we are Christian, we are all lumped together. You know what does the shepherd Peter understood the importance of making sure that he knew the difference between the sheep and the wolves. He knew who he was supposed to be protecting, who he was supposed to be guiding, who he was supposed to be nurturing. And as Peter is writing here, his concern is for the flock. His concern is for those that God has, has gave him charge over to make sure, remember, Peter is going to pass away here very soon. Okay? Uh, he is going to be martyred for his faith. And Peter said earlier, when I'm gone, you need to hold fast to the true gospel of Jesus Christ. These are some of the characteristics. These are what false teachers look like. This is their MO, modus operandi, how they operate, their method of operation. This is what we need to watch out for. Can I say we need to watch out for it here in this country? We need to watch out for it here in Michigan. We need to watch out for it here in Battle Creek. We need to watch out for it right here where we find ourselves. Peter had a lot to say about false teachers. We're going to be looking at more of that next week. Now you'll notice that uh, this week your study guides had all the fill in the blanks right, like we normally do. I'm going to fill them in for you next week because we're not going to have that out at the camp, okay? But there will be notes, and, and we're going to be talking uh, more about some of the methods that they follow and what that means for us. Let us be sure in the gospel that we proclaim 
The gospel that brings salvation, there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. In a world, according to Oprah Winfrey, that says there are many roads that lead to God, uh, Oprah Winfrey is sincerely wrong. There is only one way, and that is through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. That is the gospel. That is what we preach and what we teach. Loving Father God, we thank you for your word. Lord, may we be very quick, Lord, to know the gospel so that we recognize what isn't the gospel. And we call that out for what it is. Father, I pray that we would know and understand the best way to know the gospel is to read the gospel, to study the gospel, to live the gospel, to share the gospel. Father, we thank you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.